scheduled to be open in fall of 2015. Uh, we have uh, uh, awarded, I believe, a third of the bids, about $22 million worth of uh, bids have been approved. And we have some uh, additional <coughs> points from Scott Scottway's camp. Okay, thanks, Don. Um, one minor correction, the project's about a $22 million construction project, and we've uh, approved about a third of that or close to $7 million worth of those bids. And we've actually been under construction for a little over a month. Uh, been working with the city and the county departments, public works and planning. Uh, most of the utilities are all in place. I know there's a few uh, minor challenges that we're still working on, but we're uh, planning on opening that facility in the fall of 2015. And we feel like everything's going very well thus far. And as uh, Mr. Mayhew mentioned, we're on schedule, and we believe that we're going to be under budget with that project, so we feel really good about it. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them uh, or take a tour past uh, on East O Street and take a drive by because it's very visible right on the south end of the community college campus. So any uh, questions? All right, any questions or comments? Thank you, Scott. Uh, next, that takes us to uh, plans for the middle school in Southeast Lincoln. Maybe you should stick around. Uh, we're in the uh, process of uh, our site selection for the new middle school. I know that staff and our planning committee uh, are continuing their work on the proposal. Uh, we're hopeful to be making a determination within the next uh, month or so with possible June action. Scott, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, as Mr. Mayhew mentioned, actually prior to the bond issue, knowing that the schedule would be very intense, we did an RFP for potential middle school sites, and we had six submittals in an area in southeast Lincoln that we had kind of defined for the potential location. Um, we do intend to provide information on the two finalists to our planning committee and our board of education in the next week for them to review. And as Mr. Mayhew mentioned, hopefully within a month, we will have a determination made on the, the exact location. We've also charged ourselves to come up with the attendance area, preliminary boundaries for the attendance areas by fall of this year. Uh, that would be two years prior to the opening of the facility. And that would help families that are buying property and homes to have a good idea of where their children may attend the middle school. And it will impact three of our current middle schools, as you know, uh, Lux Middle School is definitely overcrowded, but we have pressure at Pound and Scott as well, and it does have an impact on all three of those current middle schools that kind of border the south and eastern edges of Lincoln. And then alongside that, we also have an elementary school that will be built in, El in southeast Lincoln, and we've been working very closely on those attendance areas and all of the needs for both facilities. Um, I know I've talked to a number of city staff that are in the audience today. Uh, from planning and public works we've even met before the bond issue about potential infrastructure needs uh, crossings uh, signals uh, bike paths all the types of things that would support uh, both of these two new facilities in southeast lincoln and i i think there are a number of plans that are in progress to get us to that point for opening day of both facilities and the elementary is opening fall of 16 and the middle school is opening the fall of 2017. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Um, <clears throat> so 
you've got the school, and also there's a YMCA uh, that's going to be part of that, similar to SCO. Okay, and uh, we've got a, a regional park. Is that it's going to be in the general, generally the same area too? Is that? Those are possibilities. I can't answer for Parks and Rec. I mean, I know in the 2040 comp plan, uh, they prefer park land adjacent to school sites if that can happen. And so as we purchase the potential property, once it's announced, uh, park considerations would be part of that dialogue. Okay. Uh, I guess another possibility is thinking of, of efficiencies of combining things in, in proximate areas. Uh, see Pat Leach from the libraries. Has there been any discussion about uh, <clears throat> possible far southeast branch library in that part of town? Good morning, I'm Pat Leach, the director of Lincoln City Libraries. There's been general discussion of whether we need to address a need for a new branch library in the southeast part of town. And we've been part of the discussions with Jensen Park with the Parks Department. And our discussions have included holding a potential site for a branch library in a few years okay. within that site. So our discussions have been with the Parks Department to make sure that we're planning ahead for that possible, um, for a possible branch library there. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Just Scott, what would be the plan to maximum old region of the middle school? The new middle school is proposed with an 850 student capacity. Uh, so that's pretty typical to what our last four middle schools have been when we've opened 850. It will be a similar footprint to what you've done with recent schools. I would say the program statement would be similar to SCO, Scott, and Lux in terms of the program statement. Obviously, the look of the building will be much different, but those are the last three uh, that we've built and it'll be a very similar program. Scott, why don't you explain the difference between program statement and square footage, because most of us on the school board get that, but other people. Okay. Uh, the program statement, if you've built new facilities, is lists basically how many classrooms, gymnasiums, a kitchen, dining facility, and so forth. The proposed new middle school is about 170,000 square feet, just to give you an idea of how big that facility would be. That's about twice the size of a, a new elementary school, but 170,000 square feet is a very sizable facility, and it would likely be multi-story. Uh, the YMCA component is probably another 50 to 60,000 square feet. So it's about a 230 to 240,000 square foot facility, which is almost a small high school in Lincoln. Most of our high schools are about 350,000 square feet, just to give you an idea of how big that facility or that complex could be. Uh, and we've been looking at about 25 to 30 acres uh, for the facility or for both facilities, which includes parking and all the amenities that support uh, our program needs uh, at that building. So I hope that answers the question. That does for me. I don't know if it does. Yep. Well, that raises, if I may, you mentioned multi-story, whereas I know the recent middle schools have just been single story, maybe with ramps down, you know, topography to the track of land. So it's multi-story. So what's the, what have you found to be advantageous on multi versus single? I think just efficiencies, but probably more so distance. And interestingly, we had a conversation with staff just in the last month or two, and we talked about pros and cons of the last facilities that we've built. And they talked about just the sense of community being close to collaborate with other staff within the facility. And if you look at a Scott and Lux, they're about 800 foot long, which is like two to three city blocks in distance. And so if you need to collaborate with somebody on the other end of the building, you almost need a, a period to get there and back, so to speak. And so the nice thing about SCO is we started to stack uh, learning communities, and I think we heard that loud and clear that we need to try to keep people a little tighter and closer together. Now, that'll be the challenge of, for the architects and the design team once we've selected a site, if the site is flat or if it has a lot of terrain and, and topography to it that we need to deal with. But that will be the challenge that we'll need to face. <coughs> with new schools, you have an opportunity to address public concern about safety for children. Do you want to talk a little bit about how these will be different maybe than some schools that were designed in the past? 
Okay, safety is a, a good question, and quite frankly, the bond issue, and I'm gonna branch out a little bit further, the bond issue covered safety and security issues at all of our facilities, along with technology, and so, uh, it is an important factor that we've taken into consideration at all of our buildings. And if you've been to a school building in recent months or in the last year or so, uh, we want you to go to the main entrance. That's our main focus because all other doors should be locked during the school day. More of a challenge in high schools, but we want you to go to the main entrance. We want you to check in with our secure entrance monitors. And so it's important that we have a process for people that come as visitors so that they feel like a visitor but it's safe and secure uh, and they know where to go and they have a comfortable process but it still maintains that good safety and security throughout the building and so part of it is procedural and administrative in terms of keeping doors locked but part of it is a process in terms of how we check into our buildings and even once you get in that you have a badge that identifies who you are that allows you uh, within the building to certain locations and so it's a lot more strategic today Joe Wright our director of safety and security has done a great job helping us even ramp up to a new level of that but we still want people to feel welcome so as a parent or grandparent that's coming to help and support at our buildings you still have the ability to do that we just want you to follow the process to check in so we think our buildings are definitely secure there's probably going to be another layer of security that many people may not realize is there uh, but we're providing much more safety and security at our facilities, and it is a focus. So, good question. Questions? The Super Commons meeting is a chance for uh, a selected uh, people to get together and talk, but as Scott mentioned, uh, city, county, and LPS staff have been meeting for the better part of the last two years, uh, having conversations uh, about projects related to our bonds. So, I'm sure we appreciate those conversations, and uh, we should be ready to move forward. No, I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, moving on then, the future of the uh, community learning centers. Uh, I've asked uh, Steve and Mayor Byler to uh, start the conversation on this one. Please. Well, we've been, uh, uh, Mayor and myself and uh, Barb Bartle have been meeting with uh, Leanne Johnson and John Neal and several other folks that are supporting that for the greater part of four years, uh, but more formally, I think, in the last year, year and a half, to, uh, to just wrap our arms around value of the community learning centers and full service community schools in our in our district and of course from an LPS standpoint we see this as a just a major support for kids and children in poverty particularly and, um, and ensuring that before and after school there are uh, social and academic opportunities for kids that are safe and nurturing and, and academically supportive. However the, the issue that we're confronted with widely distributed throughout the city is that those grants that have funded CLCs for the greater part of the last 10 years are expiring. And in fact, they've begun the exploration process. So this last year, our, our Board of Education uh, agreed to put some, some uh, just, just some money, foundation money, about half a million dollars, into our budget so that we, uh, we, we wouldn't run into a, a, a dollar crunch and be forced to, uh, to close down any of the CLCs. Um, that was designed on a temporary basis, not permanent, because that's not really something that should be funded with general obligation dollars. So uh, we feel like uh, we're growing rapidly. We were a thousand students last year. Our poverty numbers are going up as a school district. We're um, up between 43 and 44 percent today. We're expecting uh, significant growth again next year, and we're being challenged ever rapidly. And, feel like uh, CLCs are just doing a great job. And as we look at our academics, we look at our data, of course, to support uh, whether or not we think we, we know that it's being affected. We see higher graduation rates, um, and we see students that are in CLCs compared to those that are not. We see higher academic performance on state assessments. So, you know, from a school perspective, hopefully you see that from a community perspective, this is a difference maker in the lives of one of our kids. So I, and I, I'd leave it at that. I know uh, Mayor and I have been working to try to create uh, some, some thoughts around how do, we, how do we find permanent sustainability for that. Um, if, in fact, the community puts the same value on it that we do in terms of uh, you know, just community life and uh, how, how well we do as a, as a city compared to a lot of our peer groups around the country that don't have access to these kinds of programs. 
I think that's a very good summary of, of where it's all been in the last few years. Uh, and the city continues to participate in all those discussions. And uh, we're all trying to think through uh, what it is that we want the CLCs to do and, and how it is that they will be funded so those conversations continue. Okay. I was chief at the time. I'm not sure what his title is. Uh, Cassidy came to a commons meeting several years ago. One of his reports detailed that the cost for law enforcement in the CLC neighborhoods significantly dropped because the kids were engaged in activities to set about <coughs> mischief. Uh, is that still the trend? And does that reduce the need for more law enforcement if the kids are engaged in the going out to school program? Uh, I don't know if that's still the trend. I haven't asked in, in recent months. Um, but I'm sure that to the extent that young people are fruitfully engaged uh, in after school hours, that that's all positive for the community in a number of different ways. Um, I'm a fan of CLCs. I've seen what what they do in, in certain schools and neighborhoods in our city. I'm probably best acquainted with uh, with the Arnold CLC. And how, how many schools have CLCs? Is is there a plan uh, for the numbers of schools that we would like to see have CLCs? What's, what's Twenty-five that? Is, is the number that we have right now. Easily expand that another half a dozen based on needs, but resources won't allow for that. So we have more students enrolling in CLCs. And again, as, as our numbers go up, obviously the demand and the need is incremental increases. It's it's you know what I've seen is uh, not only does it empower students. Uh, it, it also engages them in, in the community. It uh, also brings parents in as well and helps to provide some community stability and leadership. Uh, it, it's, it's really an impressive thing. And, and you know, I, I think all of us probably were stunned, maybe, uh, by the, the results of the uh, of the study that we had, the, the Lincoln Vital Signs that came out the first of the year, and, and the needs throughout the community, but particularly for uh, minority kids. And and it's, it's almost so overwhelming to see how do you get at that. But CLCs is, is one of the tools, I think, we have in the tool bag to be able to approach some of those issues. That Larry and then Roman. Well, this is my 26th year as county commissioner, and probably one of the saddest parts of county government that we do is a juvenile detention facility. And uh, idle kids, it's just not a good thing. And uh, CL, I'm, I'm with Carl on this. Uh, CLCs serve a very wonderful function within our community. And we're all paying one way or the other. <clears throat> if we have to incarcerate somebody in a juvenile detention facility, $276 a day, and we're not sure that that even fully covers our costs. As the state withdraws in their support, we've had to pick up more of it. But it's either pay now or pay later. So the CLCs, uh, I'm seeing a lot of results. They're a good program. And uh, I agree with uh, Superintendent Joel. Funding and revenue is, is our reason for not moving forward. But I think they're an essential thing. And it's either pay now or pay later. I just had a quick question. <coughs> Um, for uh, Steve Joel, the, what what are the number of organizations that actually that actually work with the CLCs? For example, I served on the Loan Center uh, board, and I think El Centro does have one too, I believe. What are some of the other organizations who actually actively support the CLCs? Right. And I'm going to ask Mr. Neal to uh, tell me what I missed, but um, Family Services, a uh, big provider, Parks and Recreation, uh -huh. uh, YMCA is, is a provider. Brothers, big sisters. Big brothers, big sisters. Never works has been. And the sisters have transitioned to the Adam Morphin organization. And, you know, 
Cedars, yeah, thank you. Cedars? Okay. So, yeah. you know, we have we have vibrant partners, but yeah. you know that's that's a big part of our funding model. Now are they funded uh, their their participation, how is that funded? Is that funded through their organizations? Yeah, they, they uh, there's a, a fairly complicated formula, but mm -hmm. each one of the providers brings resources to the table. Okay. Some capacity, some some are uh, fee based depending upon you know the ability of families to pay, which is you know, the higher the poverty, the less likely that, that to occur. And then um, others generate funds from elsewhere, but they, they provide a significant amount. To so when you say you know that some of the grant money is disappearing, uh, that half a million uh, dollars, is that passed out equally throughout all of the CLCs or how? Well, the half a million dollars are, are board put into the, uh, into the CLCs is, just so everybody knows, we haven't spent hardly any of that this year because okay. we still have some of those grant funds. Um, but that that's a that's an emergency reserve okay. in the event that this year we we uh, funds evaporated quicker than we anticipated. We didn't want to be in a position to say to kids and families, you know, we're not going we can't continue. But that's the prospect we're facing, and and it's fast. It's, it's quickly arriving. So that was just strictly our way of saying, you know, this is a valuable program. Uh, we had some we had some resources to commit to it, but it can't be permanent. Yeah, because frankly, you know, the CLCs do a fantastic job, and I know what, what the Malone Center did with their uh, organizations. It was it was pretty impressive. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Doug and I have joined the um, police department's gang violence prevention committee as they review and update that document. And to answer a little bit towards Kathy's question, uh, the police have looked at CLCs as part of the solution in trying to prevent gang violence because they're very aware that you need to focus on children at a much younger age. Mm -hmm. By the time they're joining gangs in high school, it's, it's a much more difficult problem. And the other thing I wanted to add is that CLCs, while they do serve low-income and minority youth, they also um, have user fees and are used by working parents of all socioeconomic classes. I mean, this is valuable child care, both before and after school that allows people to get to work on time and to stay a full day at work. So it's it's also a way to support working families, period. Yeah. It's really important to understand that Lincoln CLCs are kind of a hybrid of what works across the nation. I've had the opportunity to be at several conferences, and I know Katie's been at several, Leanne, John. We actually engage the partners and the federal dollars and LPS and the city of Lincoln. And it's, it is a community solution. It is not, this is a school, it's your job to go in. And in the city of Cincinnati, the, city, the school district took it on 100%. But what that does is it reduces the resources that go into the classroom because you can't pay for a day-long teacher and then that after-school program. So you either have higher class size or fewer teachers to pay for that program. We've looked at this as before and after schools is a city issue. It's not just a Lincoln's public schools issue, and it, it benefits all of us. Now here are some of the good things that you don't see. Huntington Elementary, dress for success. Young, young men who have no male role models in their life. And this is what the principal did. He goes in and he arranges with J.C. Penney and they get white shirts and dress ties. And all of a sudden, one day a week, these young men are coming to school dressed up like little businessmen. And it sparked the neighborhood to go in to do things like buying ties and donating them so the kids can have more than one necktie. Those students then serve as ambassadors when you come into their school to greet you. Or you go to, uh, let me see, Arnold, where Dana Cranawitter is just an outstanding CLC site supervisor. And she's arranged a youth ambassador program that's engaged the entire city of Lincoln. And they have a forum a couple times a year. And, uh, they have it where they have local elected officials come and talk to them about leadership. And I know several of us sitting in this room have participated <coughs> in that leadership opportunity. These kids ask great questions, and they're third, fourth, and fifth graders. And you're looking at them going, you're pretty grown up for third, fourth, and fifth grade. So it's really, a, if you ever get an invitation, don't just throw it on the side, go do it if you can, because what you see is our future is in pretty good hands. If we didn't have that leadership academy through the CLCs, and that brings kids together from all CLCs across the school, uh, all across the district, we would wonder where our future is with our students. And this gives us a great map 
roadmap to see how we can invest minimal dollars, put in a huge community support and impact, and get great results for kids. And I think that's this is one of the best external programs that LPS supports. And I would move heaven and earth to make sure it stays in operation. Uh, so far, I'm Carl. Um, uh, to follow up on what Larry Ann said, um, I think that uh, if it were ever possible for us to expand our CLCs, that would be really good if we would do it um, citywide as much as possible, because we have a lot of working families these days, and I think that everyone could benefit from going and having uh, before and after school care that is meaningful and also there may be some of our issues with sustainability might be found in going and making it citywide uh, it might spread the burden a little bit more uh, another program that that uh, impresses me tremendously is the Dawes middle school program uh, which is has tracks in, in the arts and, and athletics and, and math and science, and and they, uh, it's my understanding, they had a limit of the number of kids that they could have in the program, and the more kids just kept coming, <laughs> and they're just uh, kind of bursting at the seams with uh, eager kids, and I remember last fall when. Uh, the lights on or whatever that, that program is and, and those those kids from Dawes were, were incredibly enthusiastic and it's uh, you don't see that in middle school kids very often you know and, and it's just great that, that that light has been turned on in those kids through that program uh, so so it's not just uh, elementary there's a few middle schools and also what North Star High School. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Kate. Um, I wanted to add too that the most if not all the CLCs also offer summer programs, and so when we think about working families, um, that's often a very difficult time of the year to find quality childcare, and the programming is outstanding. It's got educational components, and, and we talk um, in the Board of Education about the summer slide, and for kids who don't have stimulating educational opportunities in the summer, how far back they start the next school year. And so it really is important. Um, you know, many families in the community are taking their kids to the library and are home to do that or are taking them on a vacation. Um, but this allows in those 25 sites some really important summer opportunities as well. So it's year-round program. John? Uh, I can kind of want to bridge off of what Kathy talked about. On, you mentioned the ties and shirts of some of the students. And I don't know if it's appropriate right now or maybe a future meeting, but I'd like to hear more about the dress code issues in the public schools. So I'm glad to hear uh, changes in that direction. <clears throat> I don't know it's, that it's a change. I think it's an opportunity for children who aren't exposed to that environment to see something very, very different. Uh, sure. They see their teachers dressed that way, but they really don't see what value that brings into their life or how they feel. And they've never had anybody give them that shirt. You know, they can't afford to go buy that white shirt at JC Penney's, a lot of these students. When you have a school that's 86% to 98% free and reduced lunch, mom and dad are paying everything else and they're trying to stay off services, so they don't have that extra resource there. So this was a really good program, but it really raised the bar on how the students felt about each other. And I think that is the important piece. You know, we look at a shirt and say, it's a shirt and tie, we all dress like this as people. But for those children who started to participate, it spread, it started all fifth graders. Now the fourth graders want that program, and the third graders want that program. And I think that's really the thing that happens when you start a fire somewhere, it spreads, and it spreads the good or the bad depending on how you take care of it. So I, I do think the dress code, um, that's not my baby, that's <laughs> I just get to set the rules, he has to come from that. But, but the reality becomes we can do things with dress code without making it official by starting with those small steps with, with young children and saying this is appropriate and this is not appropriate. And I have teammates who, whose dress codes, I have to tell you, I wonder if their parents are going to look at them in the morning when they leave school. 
And what I hear from their parents is, well, I looked at them, but when they went to school, they didn't look like that when they walked out the door. Um, and then there are others that, when you meet the parents, you kind of go, oh yeah, now I know why your kids dress that way. So it, it is all in the acceptance of how the individuals view their, their personal family responsibilities. And it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be a challenge for dress code, but there are ways to start it without looking down on another student and how, what they can or can't afford. Well, could, could we just maybe put the dress code on a future agenda because uh, they're just some really concerning things that I've observed at our schools. John, could you, just for my benefit, articulate a city role in that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talking to her on the CLCs uh, and the effect on the police department and gangs and so forth. Harsh, I just, I cringe sometimes at what I see the young people wearing as they walk into school. And if you're, it seems like, I, I know that you had challenges in that regard in the public school system, but it, it would just seem that a certain level of uh, for themselves, the educational environment, uh, might help in other safety issues, uh, as we all are in the community. And maybe I'm just old fashioned, I'm gonna be the old guy yeah. in the block. I had welcome response from Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would merely say this. I, you know, that's something that we wrestle with. We have, got, we have guidelines, we have policies. You know, when students are, um, and or staff are dressed appropriately, um, change has to occur, and it does. And you know, there's a, a, there, there, there are penalties for non-compliance, but I'll tell you that our building principals and our teachers wrestle with it on a fairly regular basis, but it isn't something that we do ignore. So I, I, I guess, as I've been in all the schools, and most of our staff have been in all the schools, um, you know, there are, there are some extreme examples, but I think for the most part, our schools and our, and our staff are doing a pretty good job of policing that. So yeah, and, and, I, and I know that because we've tangled with parents who disagree with the strictness of some of the policy guidelines that exist in some of the schools. I thought I saw your hand up before we were talking dress code. I want, if I could, I just want to go back to the CLCs for just a second. And yeah, I, I just want to, um, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to you know, just underscore again how important CLCs are for the overall success of the community. I've been here four years as superintendent, and when I think about where we were in terms of our graduation and where we are now, and, you know, unofficially, we're going we're gonna to shoot for 90% of our kids graduating on time. But we know that there's 80 kids incarcerated today at, at the youth detention center. We know that our, our numbers of uh, students for, that are qualified for free and reduced lunch are growing. It's a great gift from this community that separates Lincoln from so much of the rest of the country. And we know that because we interact nationally. It is this before and after school environment that we've created that supports academics, social development. And I think if we were going to just boil it down to one sentence, I would say that community learning centers help communities build better people. That's that's what we're striving for, and that's that's why I think that's why I think this is a, a city, a, a, in part, a city that is so highly ranked in so many categories. But education is a centerpiece of that, and the more students we can get to the success um, uh, to, to the success goal, the better the better off the quality of life is going to be. So I just want to say thank you for your positive comments and know that we believe that this is a big part of our formula for getting uh, getting our kids to that graduation goal. Thanks, Steve. There. Just a parting thought, possible uh, agenda item next time we get together. Carol and I have had the opportunity to travel pretty extensively, and we have a, uh, some children, that uh, grandchildren that live in Denmark. Uh, they're doing year-round school. We were surprised to find out Thailand, Cambodia, even Vietnam now is going to year-round school. So as we talk about CLCs and whatnot, I guess I wouldn't mind hearing a discussion about a track system or year-round school. Yeah, I, I just have one more CLC success in hope as Carl highlighted Dodd. I'm going to highlight Goodrich because both of those are, are fairly just neighborhoods. Goodrich Middle School's after school club had the state champion robotics 
They won the state championship in building robots and, and electronics and engineering. Huge job market in the future. It's also really great with the Blooming Career Academy coming up. And those kids are going to go to it's Carlsbad, California, wherever the Lego land is out there in California, to build robots. And, and I thought it was really impressive because there's a little good rich middle school sitting down just outside of Belmont. And their kids got together in this after school club and the vision of one teacher who volunteered his time after school with these students. And he sparked fire in a highly technical science field. And a lot of kids don't see that because you don't see science necessarily unless you get that hands on. And the CLCs advances what they can do in the classroom to after school putting it into practice. And I think that's really important to be sure. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, several people have described the value of the CLCs, uh, and, and several people have also described how this is a uh, community issue, so hopefully this can be part of an ongoing uh, conversation looking for uh, sustainable funding. Uh, moving on, we've got a uh, traffic report on 14th and Superior. And right. you say Randy Hoskins. Randy? Yes. Good morning. If you don't mind, I'm going to just stand up here and talk to you. <coughs> you may want to turn around. Um, <coughs> So there's been a lot of a lot of questions floating around about the 14th and Superior roundabout, and so what's the answer? Just a quick history on it. That intersection does carry about 43,500 cars a day. Um, prior to the to the uh, project that we did, we had uh, two through lanes east-west with center turn lane and a single lane north-south on 14th Street. Obviously, we have a school um, in the in the southwest quadrant of this intersection and we have commercial on two of the other corners of the intersection. And we had a lot of access issues that came along with uh, what we tried to determine to do with this project. This is a diagram of the crashes that we had in the um, roughly uh, two and a half years prior to installing the roundabout. Each of those little lines up there indicates a, a crash that occurred, and uh, there's a lot of information on there, but I won't get into that. This is what we ended up building out there as far as, as the roundabout. Um, obviously one of, the, one of the big concerns and one of the things that we felt was important was putting in the, the undercrossings that um, also serve the, the kids that are getting back and forth over here to get to school, but also serve the trails that uh, run in through this area. This is a closer up view of, of what we ended up with in the end. Um, you know, we were all excited about it when we got it done until we saw the crash. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. Um, each of those lines represents the crash. And this is basically the first year's worth of crashes out there. So we saw this and suddenly things were not acceptable. What we were seeing was a lot of failure to yield, particularly in the east-west direction. Um, for whatever reason, people just did not want to. Part of the problem was it was flowing so well, there was no backup of traffic that people just thought they could keep going. And, and sometimes they would meet somebody in there, and uh, it didn't work so well. So of course, you know, all of a sudden, the, the opponents that were against this in the first place were saying, you know, I told you it wouldn't work. Um, it was funny because I was having people coming up to me everywhere saying, you know, I was one of those that said I hated this before you put it in, but I love it now. And then the people that really liked it initially were saying, don't change it. It's working great just because there's some stupid people that can't drive it. But I think, you know, in looking at it, we realized that we had to do something out there to, to get rid of some of the crashes that were happening. So what we did, we hired an engineer to uh, come in and give us some ideas of what we might do. One of the things he said was, you've got too much capacity. That's why cars are moving through there so quickly. Um, you actually need to reduce the number of lanes to make it safer. Um, we made the signs and markings uh, a little more legible and understandable to people. Uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me was that we had too much sight distance out there at the intersection. That's you know something we've never heard before. Sight distance is a good thing, but. But here they said, yeah, then, well, that's why people are driving so fast, because they can see forever, and they're making up their mind a couple blocks back whether or not they're going. And so they're sometimes surprised by somebody coming around. And one of the other things that, that, we, that we changed that really caught me off guard 
was changing the pedestrian signals out there from basically always resting in green to the flashing yellow. Now, when, when this came up, I just thought that was, that was kind of a throwaway recommendation. But I'll tell you what, since we have implemented that, I think that is one of the most helpful things that we've done because it's, it's, you know, it's subconscious, but as you're driving up to that, you know, before when it was green, it was like, go, right? Now as you're driving up to it, you see the flashing yellow either before you get to it or behind it. And it's, it's just, it changes your mindset, I think. So that, that was actually a very positive uh, change that we made out there. Oops. So we, we took out a lane on each of the approaches, dropped it down to just um, two lanes each, east-west, and then one lane north-south with right turn lanes. Um, we did take out the lanes on the outside, which helped some of the things we were concerned about in the future when we need that extra capacity to have to open it back up. What this does is right now we've got left turns being made out of the ultimate left turn lane. If, yeah, yeah if, if we had taken out the center, which was what we were initially looking at, then we would be teaching people to turn out of what's more or less the middle lane. And then once you opened it back up, then we we're having trouble with people probably turning out the wrong lane. So that was one of our concerns over there. One of the other things that we did um, in order to deal with the sight distance was we put this fence out here in the middle of the in the middle of the road. And one of the consequences we've noticed from that is that we don't have students crossing on these legs anymore. We are actually now getting them to cross more at the tunnels and the signals that are on the north or is on the north and the east leg. So in addition to slowing traffic down, this has been very, very successful in getting kids to do what we want them to do. Um, you can see some of the, the markings here. Um, one of the things we did was we put a black background behind them, hoping to, to uh, make them pop out a little more. We changed some of the overhead signing. And uh, here's, here's a picture of the uh, signals now in the flashing red. This is the one on the north. I'm sorry, the flashing yellow. Um, another concern we had in doing this was what would the motor's reaction be and would we be putting the kids in a safety hazard? Um, so far, we have noticed from time to time that people will run this. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not very often, but occasionally we see that. Um, but one thing we have seen is kids are, are paying attention to that and doing a good job of crossing out here. One of the things we see is that a lot of times the kids aren't even pushing the buttons to cross because again, they're only crossing half the road at a time, so they see the traffic coming out from one direction. There's nothing coming, they're just going across. When we looked at how we thought the, the intersection would operate, taking out the lanes, um, what we were told was um, it, it looked like we'd be be working fairly high levels of service. Um, one of the things we found then was that actually our volumes are down out there over what they were before when we were doing our studies. We think part of that is the fact that um, Fletcher has now been open all the way through and there's a signal up north, so I think a lot of people are no longer having to go through this intersection which dropped our, our traffic volume so. But what we're actually seeing, um, we've got a couple times a day when we do have some pretty big backups out there. Um, we get about 90 seconds maximum delay for the eastbound traffic in the morning and about 60 seconds southbound. And a lot of that is people going to or from Goodrich and also people coming to and from Scoa and Cooper. And then in the PM, we also see some backups about 90 seconds in each direction. But other than those peak times, we're seeing very little delay out there. And, and one of the interesting things about it, this is a uh, picture at 750, we'll call it 751 in the morning. And this car right back here is about 80 seconds away from the intersection. Now, this is at 753. So a little over two minutes later, the queue is gone. So that's what we're seeing. It's, it's very short term out there that, that we see any delay, and then it's gone, and most of the day it's working fine. This is the northbound in the evening. Again, um, the speed 459, 503, it's gone. So um, even though uh, we do get some backups, people are constantly moving, we 
which makes it seem like you're not sitting there quite so long. And uh, it seems to be working fairly well. <coughs> Here's the big one, though. Um, when we look at crashes, and you can see a number of time periods here, and we'll, we'll con concentrate on the, uh, the blue column here. And basically, these are annualized numbers. Before we put in the roundabout, we're averaging about 27 crashes a year. When, uh, when we opened it that first year, we had about 120 crashes. What we found <coughs> since we've made the changes is we're now down to, we're, we're expecting to have about 33, 34 crashes this year. Now the other, the other bigger number though, the more important one, is if you look at the green column, that's the average crash cost. You notice before we put in the roundabout, those crashes were averaging about $4,400 a crash. Now, down to about $1,500. So you can see that even though we've slightly increased the number of crashes that we're having, if you look at the overall effect of those crashes, we're actually saving about $50,000 a year in crash costs. And that doesn't include injury crashes. The injury crashes have gone down from 48% to 8%. So, you know, if you've got that many fewer people being injured in these crashes, that's a big deal. And you can see on the right side there, percent of total vehicles, total vehicles in those crashes has just um, dropped off completely. One of the problems we're seeing is we're still having those failure to yield crashes. That's been the primary one. A uh, few rear ends, people, I guess, expecting them to be stopped. So, um, we do have a few of those. So as I said, crashes are down significantly. They're still occurring at a higher rate than what we would like to see. And I wish I had an answer for, for why they're still happening. Um, as, as I said, before we, we made these changes, there, were, there was basically no delay out there. Any time of day, it was surprising to see even four cars backed up. Um, as you saw now, we do have some times when we, we have a lot more cars backed up, but again, they continue to move. Question came about is there kind of a happy medium that you can do? I think right now we're probably we're uh, pretty pleased with the, with the way it's operating, both efficiency and safety. So I think uh, what we've what we've done is we've received uh, word from the mayor to go ahead and basically make things more permanent. Uh, basically taking out the, the pavement markings and the tubes that we've got out there and putting in curves, which we think will also help make things operate a little smoother out there. Some people don't want to pull out as far as they can just because they don't feel secure with just um, the mark <coughs> markings out there. And then I guess the, the next question is, do we build more multi-lead ground models? And that's, that's one we're probably still struggling with. There. With that, I would be glad to take a look. Kathy? Since I put this in the agenda because a family of friends whose children go to Goodrick, so you answered the one question of kids now using the underground passageways and the crosswalk. Because I always remember my kids, and by the time they, they took the fastest route, they didn't necessarily walk out there. So the kids is good. The second thing is on what I think causes the crash is because they drive it a lot. And my husband and I were coming home yesterday, and on the way out of town last week, both times it was someone, I use a big number of license plates, sorry, that's just like, <laughs> you know they're not from Lincoln, they're, they're not through little letters, but they're not familiar with this type of, of uh, traffic pattern. So this might be something, if we were still teaching driver ed and LPS, then this would be easy, I would say, somebody put a lesson in there on driving around about, because I don't know that there's any instruction anywhere on what they are. So is, can we talk to the local providers of driver education and say, why don't we put in some instructions on a, on a roundabout? Because if we're going to use more of them in Lincoln, it would be really nice if the people teaching it here in Lincoln had that instruction. So I'm all about education. I think that helps. The, the young girl that was driving in front of me, and I'm sure she was a college kid, you can see her hands on the steering wheel were like this, right in front of us. And my road rage has been going he was that third comment um, on the thing. <laughs> so I think that education piece might help if we can figure a way to do that and work with our local providers of driver education. That, that's got to be a solution. So that's, that's a good point. I do know that the driver's manual now has information in it on how to drive around the house, which doesn't help any of us who never take, take the test anymore. But, um, 
Yeah, that's, and, and I guess one of the things, kind of hitting on it, um, we had gone, since we made the changes, we had gone like over a month without any crashes. Then the weekend of Girls State basketball, we had four crashes. So it tells us visitors are coming to town and they stop because we sat there for 60 seconds just to the store and go. And, and I don't know if she didn't know where to look. I don't know if she didn't have any idea. I, you know, you, you can't figure it out, but the track backed up way behind us because the one person didn't go in the front and they put things don't crash in and coming up behind us. So. Thanks, Kathy. Any other comments or questions? Larry? Um, certainly it has improved when you've gone down to eliminating the third lane. But uh, your comments about less traffic being on there, certainly all the truck semi-traffic has learned to avoid that intersection. It didn't, uh, it just doesn't work to bring a 65 foot semi around those, around those curves. So the grain trade is very concerned about uh, you going with more roundabouts, uh, particularly if you went on Hornester Highway, because right now, instead of coming up 14th Street, they're going uh, down 180, going around Cornhusker Highway and going in there. We have four major grain terminals uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they need a way to get in. There's millions of dollars worth of economy that comes in uh, through those uh, channels, and at least they need to be able to get to the south uh, elevators. They need to be get uh, the ones on Cornhusker Highway and on North 27. So very concerned about right away is uh, taking uh, semis through roundabouts. Uh, not just county farm bureaus went on record to pose anymore and uh, the green from the law breakers have too. I can tell you this is my route to and from work every day and uh, I do see do see semis driving through here regularly. Um, see very few problems with it. I've seen short coupled uh, delivery trucks. Uh, I go through there at least four times a week and I have not seen a green semi and I know in the talk in the terminals, uh, people just don't go through there with, with long uh, semis. I can say I've not seen any green trucks. Other comments? Thank you, man. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so thank you all for your time. Let's do this again uh, more often and we are now adjourned.